focusing predominantly my efforts on that, but I also have a female founder partner conversation network called Virgin for Buses in Northern Nevada, where it helps early stage startups um, founded by women have a conversation in a safe manner. So that's just a secondary activity that we do. But mainly what I've been doing for the northern part of the state is helping diversify through Startup Nevada and other entities think about ways in which they can bring in other talent to the stage in northern Nevada when we have a lot of events. It's predominantly been a particular type of individual and it's important to have diversity of thought. And so I've been actively whispering in the governor's ear, leading this pitch competition a few years ago or whomever I had the opportunity to interact with. So I think I've been making a big impact for women in predominantly northern Nevada. So I was delighted that I got invited and written to some grant, I guess, to help bring some thought down. And I'm really looking forward to learning. And I'm really excited to meet all of you and see what I can do to help you all think big. Because at the end of the day, the goal for me personally, until I take my dirt nap, is to help with um, wealth creation for women. Um, my name is Marta Tegan Lopez Venture. Um, our company is Safe Harbor. And my co founder Lindsay and I started about two years ago in Napa, California. Um, we, sell to, or we are just lost our seed phase and completed our prototype to begin selling our harbor technology. And we've created it for the campus supply chain. Both a compliance driver and a chain of custody automation tool that helps with the regulatory environment where the new cannabis industry is launching. And so, what we created is something similar to an Amazon Prime Locker. Um, we can install it in retail facilities to secure and provide safe consumer distribution, both on the ID verification side and with inventory tracking. Um, and then we also have a product that installs into transport vehicles to monitor this product when it's not at a licensed facility and on a public roadway. So our manufacturing partner is here in Las Vegas. They have competency and market share in slot machines. Um, as such, they are familiar with regulated hardware and currency transactions, both which we address with our product. Um, so we relocated from the Bay Area to Las Vegas in June. I'm really excited to be here. Um, we involved the Startup Nevada in their entrepreneurship community. Met a long number of really great people in the last few months here. And so, Maria, you know, I'm going to ask a question and we'll just bring it back. Can, it, can everyone hear me? Fine. Uh -huh. yeah, I will be out loud with my military voice. <laughs> <laughs> what is harder on a regular basis than you anticipated before you started the company? So, what is something that you didn't expect to be so difficult that's kind of come up harder? Um, well, you hear a lot about having the agility to pivot, and that's something that I think Lindsay and I, alongside our partners, have been really good at addressing as we try to achieve product market fit. Um, the industry we're in, cannabis and legal cannabis markets, is evolving, and so as new states on board and regulations go through draft and change, there's um, adjustments we've had to make. So we started out in touching the consumer side of the supply chain and end user delivery for home delivery. And as we've met with operators um, trying to secure our pilot partnerships, we found that there's applications upstream in business to business wholesale that are more, while they have less touch points, might add more value to the industry. So we've had to have agility and be able to um, be able to ascertain and communicate the need to slightly modify our production plans or our prototype plans um, so that they don't create too much of a time choke on our manufacturing partners and, our, and we keep our vision strong. Oh my gosh, isn't this amazing? Like, <laughs> I'm, I'm sitting here envisioning a really cool pink background on gas company. I, I'm already there. I'm so excited. Uh, data security, and I'm wondering what you're doing black with black so that's so bad. <laughs> <laughs> the question is, what is harder on a regular basis than you anticipated before you started the company? Okay. I was already down. Ooh. Okay, so um, what's hard? Hard is so I girl made is a passion project. I bought it. I don't take a salary. I completely volunteer basis my time. So this is all about me changing the landscape and dialogue. I'm very committed to it, and I think that's hard to balance that with the rest of your life. You know, having multiple hustles or passion. I mean, it's easier to get paid for what you love to do, and so I just really have 
pursued that because I've been working in Silicon Valley for so long. So that's been really hard. And then when my kid asked me to quit school, that was hard. And so then I essentially felt like I was Montessori it around that with getting her. She won the Samsung Software Tomorrow Challenge in DC, you know, 150,000 for the state, then went on to Techstars and was the youngest kid to win Techstars in our city, developed an app, and then she got busy. And I mean, I can't even keep track of that dog really young at 15 or something. But so I was working with Girl Empire as a means to help her stay busy and her mind and using those concepts. And then we call lots of incredible women around her and she just was thriving. So now the success that she is is a direct result of being around everybody that's here. Like just everyone encouraging and inspiring her. So that's what I've been doing is really focusing in my time on finding a way to continue to pivot and shape and contour the offering. We recently went to Africa, did, a, did an incredible two different Girl Empire programs in two different townships, or one in a township and one in a city. And it was, I mean, I just can't express the challenges that I have with getting 10-year-old to 18-year-old girls on a Saturday morning to talk about entrepreneurship. Like, what the hell is that? <laughs> I mean, some of them have parents that may or may not be in that field, but it's really a hard sell because it's a, the audience that we're selling to is underage, and there's a whole set of issues relating to how you sell to multiple audiences, right? Like in the supply chain. So if you have tickets are really expensive and scholarship things, but to get young girls that's 10 into us on their Saturday morning at 10 o'clock to come in, that is not, that's a hard sell. You need celebrities, you need millions of stuff. So fortunately, we've been able to make it happen, and all the girls that attend are just like remarkably astounded and consistently like, I didn't know you just could do this. Like, I didn't know you could do this. What? What did I do? So it's just been an incredible journey, and I have so much work to do. So I look forward to hearing from all of you in Southern Nevada. Maybe it's really easy to get young girls together in different states, but I think nobody's been doing this space because it has been really hard. And until we work on changing the media landscape, the content creation, the, the investment dialogue and how we invest, we won't see that change. So hopefully it happens before I die, but in the meantime, I'm out here hustling. Go girl. <laughs> Thank you. 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 I think um, this is something that I don't hear anyone else talk about, and I talk about it all the time to my own community because they're basically my, my advisory board and therapy group. <clears throat> Whatever issues you have personally prior to starting a business are going to go right to the top. <laughs> so, like, it's like in a relationship, right? In an intimate relationship, like, whatever daddy issues, mommy issues, abandonment issues, whatever, are going to bubble to the top. And so, um, I started my business with a business partner, but three months in, she, her life changed. And uh, then a year later, after, after a very strong operating agreement, by the way, that still took a year to negotiate the force. Um, I, I think the hardest thing has been for me to, to keep my mindset right and straight. I talk myself off the ledge every day. I go back and forth from, and by the way, I really was a sailor, so if I do cuss like a sailor, it's because I was. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I really try not to. Like, my, my inner love mom left right now is like, she's like, don't say that, don't say that. <laughs> Done. Did I just invest all of my money, all of my savings into this? And then I also see um, the, the ripple effects of the women whose lives have changed and have found community and you know have a beautiful place to go to every day. And those are the those are the, the moments that my cousin's life that I met with my accountant the other day, and she said, Shelly, you had a 40% increase in revenue year over year. Like, that's a big deal. And I almost burst into tears and wanted to hug her. <laughs> like, like, it is, right? Thank you. Because you feel so, I feel very alone in it. You can feel very, very alone. So um, this past year, I would say, my I have been so about my mindset and just staying positive and uh, working out whatever issues that I see bubbling up in myself. So because I, I think women, we have a hard time asking for help. We, I say this all the time, and it's going to get me in trouble here because there's, there's a man in here. But I'm like, my greatest, my greatest hope is to see all women 
have the amount of confidence that the most mediocre man I've ever met has. <laughs> Yes, it was not promotional, it was preventive. <laughs> it was an action and mission instead of, instead of, I did this, I did this, and these are my accolades. And, and I think that that went back to what Sylvia was saying earlier, is how different we are as a gender, as women, that we bring forward, it can be a vulgar motion, and, and I too serve in the military, and you're like, Anna, you're making it, you're being, you're you're making this too emotional. And then I realized, by not dealing with the emotions, that is emotional. By not by ignoring them, by denying them, it becomes emotional. And I find it so amazing that the three of you came from a perspective of this is who I am and this is where I stand in the moment. And that's a beautiful thing. Um, can I keep She's back there. Okay, can you just, I'm not going to keep track of time, so you don't mind just keeping me on track. Okay, um, move on to the next question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm going to start showing you, you went to the Naval Academy, that's still a pretty male-dominant area, a <coughs> percentage of women-to-male ratio. In my class, there were 2,000 in total, 154 women. 150, out of how many? 2,000. 2,000, yeah. What skills did you learn there for dealing with subtle or not-so-subtle biases that we run into in business on the part of men? Besides cussing like a sailor. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it, it served me in my four years. Yeah, um, a lot of skills. I would say um, men are way better at leveraging, and I learned that a lot in the military, leveraging their experience, leveraging talking about themselves, boasting about themselves. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, I also learned that. Um, like, so prior, after the, the military and corporate world, I worked in the music industry, so my younger brother is the singer Pitbull. And talk about, like, it was like an MBA, and watching him rap these songs about his jet, his, you know, like, all the things that happened to him long before he had them. Now he has all of those things, but he was rapping about them, talking about them long before they were in existence. So speaking words into existence. Words are so powerful and so important. So that's also something that I think is, that I've learned that's very important. And as far as beings, and there's been many, many times, I'm sure all of you can relate to this, where you're the only woman in the room. When I have younger women ask me about that, and then leverage it. They'll remember the only woman in the room. You know, instead of being it, like, oh, I'm the only woman again. Like, I'm the only woman, perfect. <laughs> like, I mean, yeah, exactly, show it, stand in it. And, um, and, and I just, in, I would say in my 20s in the corporate world, I tried to pretend to be like the men. And I can tell you stories that think all of you guys would be horrified, which is stuff I'm sure that you, in the military, yeah, if you, the things you now would be like, uh, hashtag me too. <laughs> 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 that we just tolerated it to keep going. Um, yeah, so I would just say, as a if young woman starting out, like just be who you are, always be who you are, and don't pretend to be something else to try to fit in with men, ever. Mm -hmm. Yes. Hashtag preach. <laughs> <laughs> so Lauren, for your mission to get more girls into tech and management, how early and how do you reach them? The name is girl made, so what does that mean? So we try to reach them between 10 and 18, and sometimes the girls are even younger if they have some maturity, right? Like a lot of six-year-olds sometimes really have great ideas and they have enough attention that they can stay through the event. And it's because it's an unconference, we don't lecture, we don't have slides, it's completely volunteer-based, like you know, lady bosses walking around, we have this little methodology that we use, and it's interspersed, so it's really active, it goes by quickly. We have a singer that does a call out, Grace Hayes, she's like turning TikTok in this year in Nevada. So I mean, we have really fun things that we do. So I think one thing can change by making it not my age related style. It's age appropriate content for them, facilitated by women. Then, and there's a certain culture of women that we look for, right? And so we curate that. And the second question was tech. And it's really hard with tech. I mean, I partner with different companies like Apple and Microsoft. And, 
just like the museums that do a lot of tech, we do a tech heading zoo where they can see Google Glass or the Samsung, whatever technology is kind of du jour. We bring it in, we let them interact with it, we let them touch it, tech heading zoo, just because there's some basic things, but it's really hard to say, okay, quick, like dive in and start coding. I mean, it takes some time. So, because the Atlantic Magazine called me the one woman in Reno trying to be the girl to code of entrepreneurship, that's me. But it's, it's going to take a lot more time in the ecosystem to do the right partnering with the right organization. So that's what I've been focusing on. Like the girls who make games or any of these other organizations, we help to work with whomever's interested in partnering. And then we'll see over time where this goes. So to answer the previous question, I say no a lot. I haven't scaled it. I mean, Obama invited me to South by Southwest to celebrate my ideas at the White House and South Lawn with all these incredible people. And we haven't been rolling it out like in a rapid pace because we're I'm really looking at the model, trying to find the right fit if we are to scale it and take it more commercial. And right now I don't need to. So it's been great. And yet there's still this challenge with young kids. So I have a lot of work to do and I don't know that I had a succinct answer, but hopefully that gives you some, you know, real talk. Thanks, Mike. Right. You're in the past space. <laughs> so is, is logic dealing with small, valuable products also? But how do you deal with the constantly evolving regulatory landscape around cannabis? Uh, well, I'll just give a little backstory. Um, prior to starting this company, I spent 10 years in California's emergency industry managing greenhouses. In the last five years, I'm a manager of overalls. So that was very male dominated in um, Northern California. And just recently, it's, there's been a little bit more gender parity um, as the green rush has opened. So we had, a, I met Lizzie, she came as a, to build some sustainable housing at the farm. And we met five years ago, six years ago, she was an architect. Um, and we were some of the only two <coughs> that property for five, six months we were there. Um, during that time, though, we we're in the position to see the unfolding regulations in California. So we've got a real taste of how slight adjustments to the legislative process or the public policy um, reform process would mean real things to the operators that were investing in infrastructure. Um, so we took our product as we moved to New York and here to Nevada. We have been having a closer look at examining the way that regulation is playing out in different state markets. And it comes down to, because this is the technology running the legal cannabis industry, it comes down to a couple of decisions that a state makes when it wants to legalize that will determine its regulatory rollout and then the way its supply chain is delineated. And the first decision there is what state reporting platform they'll use um, for the entire industry in that state. We've been lucky. Uh, or that might be the wrong word, but there is a market leader that is capturing most of the state markets, and that's called Metrics. So we looked at Metrics platform, how they have delineated the data that will be captured for chain of custody, and the variations there we can rely on their uh, infrastructure looking state by state. The politics on a state by state basis have really influenced how we look at scaling. And so we really have to just consider uh, even though there's a bit of hypocrisy built into the, the capitalization of the cannabis industry around these protected state markets, we have to be really vocal in our focus um, at this point and probably for the next five years. I find it very interesting that you mentioned swearing a lot, which is typically a male thing. You mentioned saying no, which is typically a male thing. And we've already talked about pop, which is industry-wide, there's not a lot of women in that space. So it's it's very interesting that here we are, and we're talking about the things that we're talking, we're all mentioning uh, unapologetically, like this is the space I'm in, and I'm gonna swear, I'm gonna say no, and I'm gonna go into an industry that's typically not meant for my gender, and that is such a beautiful thing. So I have, I have one more question to ask. No, no, no. Thank you.